Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, Rosemary Church of Christ Wednesday night. And uh, if you've been following this series, you know that tonight we are going to try to do a summary of the last 12 weeks where we have looked at what uh, we call the minor prophets. And again, as a reminder, we call them minor prophets because they are shorter books than Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. Uh, before we get into that, I want to uh, introduce tonight with a little bit of a side comment. I've been working very diligently for the last two weeks, uh, going through boxes and boxes of old photographs. In part because uh, Kathy and I will be driving on Saturday back to Pennsylvania to spend a few days with some family that's coming in from other parts of the country as well as the ones who live there. But if you look back at old photographs as we've been doing, there are some that you want to immediately throw in the trash. And then there are some that are so funny you just have to keep them but show them to somebody. But one photograph in particular that uh, caught my attention was uh, the year that Kathy and I got married, 1974. And we are standing outside at the bottom of the steps going up into the first house that we ever bought. And my clothing that I am wearing is absolutely hysterical. Uh, most of you, at least some of you, are old enough to remember bell bottoms and paisley shirts and so bell bottom trousers. And so it's been an interesting time. And we look back on those things, I do at least, and I think, why did I ever do that? And you know, all those questions about what was really important and what was life like. And the answer is we did it because that was the time and place we lived in. And I want to use that to begin tonight to say that one of the reasons that we should study the Old Testament, in particular these prophetic books. Number one, they are probably not the part of the Bible that has the most underlines and highlights on it. And number two, what we learn is that even though we don't quite look like those people in terms of clothing and geography and maybe even some skin color and, and language, humans have not changed all that much. And so when I look back at these old photographs from 20, 30, 40, 75 years ago, some of them when I was a baby, uh, even though I'm not the same, I am. And I see the similarities. And my idea in introducing the tonight this way is that the human condition has not appreciably changed. We are still made in God's image. We are still subject to sin, temptation, and failure, but we are still open to and have the opportunity for forgiveness and mercy and grace and accomplishment uh, and living out a life that has meaning and purpose. I, for one, do not believe that history is just one endless series of events with no purpose. I believe as God's people, God has promised us what the end is going to be. And so we live today with a view to the end. We know what the end is going to be, so we need to live each day of our life with live it to the fullest under God's control and within God's plan, but live it fully knowing what the end is going to be. Many people around us have no sense of an ending. Just every day is another day to be endured and to go through and suffer through sometimes. And then they ask, what's the point? And the point is that life is not meaningless. Life is not without purpose. And that we can know what those things are if we will fix our eyes on Jesus. Uh, tonight in this summary, excuse me, I'm going to uh, share some ideas about things that are coming up. I believe that the Bible, all of the Bible, we have to first understand it in its original context and culture and historic setting, but all of the Bible is also intended to be an application process for us everywhere in the world, and not I don't mean us, just us Americans, but for human beings. 
in every time, in every place, in every culture, in every language, the Bible is applicable. It is about living the abundant life. And so I want to begin tonight with reading with you <clears throat> John 3, 16 and 17. You say, oh, I know that one. Well, good. You could read it or uh, recite it along with me. But this is a key scripture for understanding both the Old Testament and the New Testament and how God speaks to his people. So John says in chapter 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And now we, as the followers of Jesus, his disciples, his church, our purpose is the same. God sent his Son into the world to save the world. Our purpose, our mission, is to proclaim the glory and beauty and power of Jesus is Lord. And our job is not to condemn the world, but that through the blood of Christ and our communication processes, evangelism, if you will, the sharing of this good news, that the world through Jesus might be saved. Now, the 12 Minor Prophets were not a fun series in terms of, oh, it's all joy and happiness and good news, was it? There was a lot of, you guys are messed up. You got this all backwards. And it was a lot of chastisement. But I want you to go back, if you don't recall, go back and read through these little books again. Because every time God sends a prophet to correct Israel, to call his people to repentance, it always ends also with a promise of hope and forgiveness and a better future. And so... Think about these prophets as God's voice of discipline. But with the voice of discipline, it is not a rejection of his people, but a call to repentance, a call to change, a call to grow. Now, I know many of us don't like that change word, but change is the only constant in life, and change is what is expected of us, required of us, if you will, as Christians, if we are to faithfully follow Jesus. Now, of these 12 prophets, only one, Obadiah, is written to somebody other than Israel. It's written to their cousins, the descendants of Esau, the Edomites. And the Edomites were so proud of themselves and so sure of themselves and so confident of their own strength that their arrogance allowed them to be cruel and uncaring and lacking compassion. And God's basic answer is, you think you're so great. Well, you just wait. Your turn's coming. Now, you might say, well, what about Jonah? What, didn't he go preach to the Ninevites? Yes, he did. But the book that records what Jonah did was written for the Jewish people, for their learning, and now for ours. And so what I want to say, Hear you, what I want you to hear is this, that God sends his prophetic voice to his own people. Sometimes, like in, I, excuse me, like in Jeremiah in particular, God will single out some group. And I, I believe it's Jeremiah or Ezekiel, but I believe it's Jeremiah, says to the people of Sidon and the king of Tyre and some of these other places, you guys are going to be punished for your evil. But the primary emphasis of all those Old Testament prophets, with the exception of Daniel, is to bring correction to God's chosen people. And so my experience in the church has been that we love to hear what I call the priestly voice. That's the voice of God's priests working among his people who say, now you're God's people, and you're good people, and you're nice, and you're safe, and nothing bad really should happen to you because God is on your side, and you are on God's side, and it's the voice of maintenance. It's the voice of continuity, and we love that voice. Unfortunately, in my experience in the church, 
we've often taken the priestly voice to address the world and say to the world, you're bad, you're rotten, you're no good, you're going to go to hell unless you decide to listen to me or us. And I can't find much of that in Scripture. What I do find is that God says the world is lost. The world is already condemned. But I came to provide life. And so the priestly voice that we don't really want to hear about ourselves is the voice God sends to us. And that's why, or one of the reasons why, we went through these 12 minor prophets. It's a call for repentance and change. Not for the world to repent and change, but for God's people to repent and change. The world, we look at it and we say, well, the world is full with corruption and indifference and immorality and arrogance and bitterness and hatred and inequality and false teaching and ideologies and love of money and theft and wasted lives and murder and oppression. And that's true. That is the condition of a world without God. It always has been true. It always will be true that that is the condition without God. But the prophetic voice speaks to us. And the prophetic voice speaks to us about our idolatry. The things that we put in front of God or the things that we use as a substitute God, if you will. Jesus came to his own people. And what did he say? And John the Baptist as well. What was their message? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance means change. Change, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven, is, Jesus says, is among you. The, he says the kingdom of heaven is within you. And so what begs the question, change from what? And change to what? One is when this change, this repentance, means we need to abandon the ways of the world. And I know that as I was growing up and part of the church, that meant some specific things. It meant no cussing, no alcohol, no tobacco, uh, and our, no dancing where we were, uh, no pool halls, no playing cards. I mean, the list went on and on and on of things you have to stop doing in order to be pleasing to God. But they were all about outward behavior in a place where we might intermix, intermingle with people who were not Christians. But repentance is so much bigger than that. Repentance is not just, I won't do something that I, that I believe is overtly bad. Repentance is about a change of heart. So when Paul writes about it in several places, he'll make up a list and he'll say things like anger and bitterness and rage and selfishness and, and all those kinds of things that are not acts of the flesh. They're attitudes of the flesh and of the heart. And he says, instead, change. Live the fruit of the Spirit. You know, those other lists, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the things that change us from the inside out. Faith in God. We change from faith in taking care of ourselves to faith that God is in control of his world and he is taking care of us. Not just us, he's taking care of his whole world. We need to live that faith the way that Jesus does with the Sermon on the Mount. You know, it's one thing to say, well, you know, I don't want to, I'll just, let me start over. I don't want to stand before God at judgment and say to God, you know what, God? We're the Church of Christ. We got Sunday morning down to a science. It is perfect the way we do it. And then God says, well, what about that second greatest commandment of loving your neighbor as yourself? Is the commandment about having weekly communion important? Yes. Is it the second greatest commandment? No. And God calls us to live out the Sermon on the Mount. You know what that's like. God, we may have our liturgy done to perfection, but in the Old Testament, in these prophets that we looked at, 
The Jews said, we've got our temple worship and our synagogue worship. We've got it down to a science. And the prophet says, on behalf of God, I hate your assemblies. I hate the sacrifices you bring. Why? Because they don't match your heart and your life. And Christian living is about living a life. It's not about what we do on Sunday morning. That's one very, very tiny part of it. It's not about that. It's about living the way Jesus says. We too, unfortunately, and I'm going to talk about us as Americans for a little while, we too are idolatrous people. Well, we claim to trust God. We claim to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But our loyalties are divided. Our loyalties are being torn apart. And if there's anything Satan loves, it's division. I don't mean the math part of it. I'm talking about division between people. What is our culture like right now? It's totally divided. It's divided again black and white. It's divided Democrat and Republican. It's divided. You, fig, you pick it, it's divided. You pick the subject. It won't matter. We are being led to believe that the only thing we can do is learn to hate more efficiently. And that is so foreign to Christianity. The idolatry part is that some of us and I get caught in this sometimes too. I'm not throwing rocks at anybody else. I'm preaching to me and us. Some of us get caught up in the idolatry, if you will, of economics. I have my 401k. Oh, the stock market's crashing. Oh, life is going to end. No. God never promised your 401k was going to last as long as you live. What he promised is he would be with us and never leave us or forsake us. For some of us, uh, our idolatry is an elephant. It's called the Republican Party. And we love everything about the Republican Party. And it just goes on and on. And we, we have to win this election because otherwise America and the world, if you'll excuse me, it will just go to hell in a handbasket. That's not trusting God. That's trusting an ideology. Some of us love a donkey. And we believe that if we have enough, if Donald Trump wins again, oh, the world is going to crash and burn and we've lost everything. Our hope is in our po political party. Our faith, our idolatry is in a political party. And God says, no, no matter who's the president, no matter what the economy, no matter what the culture, no matter what the form of government, God says, I'm still in charge of this world. God says he's in charge of his universe. We don't want to put our faith in a donkey. We don't want to put our faith in an elephant. We need to put our faith in the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But how do we know if we're doing that? We know by whether or not we're living out the things that Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I want to be very particular here for a minute. Most years, I don't bother watching political conventions, especially every four years, when we have them. It's not every year, I know that. But I watched them this year, and I was really upset, not distraught, but bothered that through the whole Democratic Convention, there was no mention of God. They did not include God in the pledge. They, did, they want to take God, uh, one nation under God, off of uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. They, wanted, they, they totally ignored the whole concept of God. And I think that's terrible. But I think it's equally terrible that the Republican Party wants to co-opt God and say, we're God's chosen people. We're the ones that God wants to run the world. Because that's not true either. I think Mike Pence, as Vice, Vice President Pence, is a good guy. I do. I think he's honest. I think he's upright. A person of uh, integrity, in spite of being in government. But when he gave his speech and he said, 
We need to fix our eyes on old glory, which was a paraphrase of Hebrews 12. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. What he was preaching was that America is the salvation of the world, and it is not. Jesus is the salvation of the world. Jesus is the Savior of the world. It is him in whom we must put our trust. Why, why, why do we get caught up in this idolatry? Well, because we live in a world that's filled with it. And some of it eventually becomes very appealing. You know, and it goes all the way from, I really like an 85-inch television, to I want a brand new pickup truck or what, you name it. The idolatry of things is so terrible in our culture. We are taught in our culture that we deserve everything. We need and want instant gratification. We want to have whatever makes us comfortable. And the idol of comfort that we worship at, comfort and convenience, is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus never promised, if you'll follow me, you will have a comfortable, convenient, everything at your fingertips life, did he? No, he said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. We sing some great theology. We sing about the way of the cross leads home. But we don't want to carry our own cross. We sing about, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me. But what cross are we willing to bear? What are we willing to give up in the sense of idolatry? That if we stop worshiping this world and its ideas and its goods and turn and face Jesus, turn our eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. That's the challenge. That's the challenge of all these Old Testament prophets to the Jewish people. Stop looking at the nations around you. Stop supporting these terrible kings that you have in your country. Put your faith and trust in God. The primary role of the church is not to condemn the world. The primary role of the church is not to regulate the world. The primary role of the church is not to fix the world. The primary role of the church is not to bless a politic or a form of government. The primary role of the church is to live the way of the cross. Remember that other song? The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross is the way of forgiveness. The way of the cross is about bearing one another's burdens. The way of the cross is about loving mercy and living justly and having compassion for other people. The way of the cross, the way of the primary role of the church is the way of the two greatest commandments. To remember God's in charge. Love him with everything we have because that's where our, our safety is. That's where our promise is. That's where our hope is. And to love our neighbor as ourself. I'm seeing the, the uh, things come up on the screen about the children who uh, were lost in the flood. And it's terrible. I want you to think about the rescue workers that were in there trying to find them. And I'm seeing here that one of them had one of the children in his grasp and lost him or her. And it brings us to tears. We are God's rescue workers. And when those rescue workers went to find those children, they didn't first say to the mother, you had no reason to be here. Why didn't you take better care? They did not slap her in hand or slap her mouth. They went to find the lost children. That's our role. Our role is not to be the prophetic voice of the world and say, you're lost, you're lost, you're lost. We know it's true, but that isn't what they need to hear. 
What they need to hear is the good news of Jesus Christ. The way of the greatest commandments lived out in generosity. Loving our neighbor generously. Forgiving generously. Showing mercy generously. Experiencing and sharing joy generously. Listening to somebody that we totally disagree with and walking away in a generous, God-given peace. We're not here to win arguments. We're here to convince folks of their need for Jesus Christ. We are here to live the way of turning the other cheek. We are here to live the way of praying for our enemies and of doing good to all, especially those of the household of faith. I uh, wrote an article last week, and I'm happy to say it is going to... Here in Taberna, in this development, we have our own little monthly newsletter that comes out. And I submitted it, and they're going to print it. And I'd like to share it with you tonight as kind of one way to think about what it means to live the way of the cross, to live the way of Jesus within a situation, a life situation, of conflict and chaos all around us. So this says, Hi, fellow Tabernians. That's our way of talking here about our development. It says, I think we're all in agreement that 2020 has been a tough year, at least so far. Still, even with a hurricane, tornadoes, and an earthquake, and COVID-19, we are surviving. My wife, Kathy, said something I found to be profound a few nights ago. She said, I don't think anyone eats better than us. And I went, huh? And Kathy said, we have a cooked meal every day. I don't think anybody eats better than us. So yes, many things are good or not so good, depending on our perspective. Isn't that great to think that way? We have food. We are not worried about whether or not we're going to have the next meal. God is taking care of us. Even in the midst of hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, and COVID, and all the things that are associated with that, lack of fellowship, all the things that we are enduring, God's still taking care of us. Now, what she said got me to thinking about a friend of mine whose first name is Brian. Uh, Brian and I used to live relatively close together in the Northeast. Uh, he preached for one church, I preached for another one. Uh, now, because of geography, we are simply Facebook friends. He lives in Tennessee, and I'm here in North Carolina. But in the midst of the political turmoil of this year, Brian has started a new weekly post. And he does this once a week. And Brian loves the country he lives in, America. Uh, he's a solid citizen. But he believes that God so loved the world, not just us in the United States, but God so loves the world. And so once a week, he picks a country of the world and says a simple post, God bless, I believe last week it was Paraguay. God bless Paraguay. I've never been to Paraguay, don't know much about it, but I'm certain God loves those people. And he will pick any country in the world each week, and simply that prayer, that short prayer, God bless Bangladesh, God bless India, God bless Albania. You pick the country, it doesn't matter. What a great idea. <clears throat> what a great idea. Of course he wants God to bless these United States, but not just us. God wants to bless everyone, especially through his church, and that's us. And so the idea occurred to me, in view of the conversations that I hear every day around me, we have an election coming up in a few weeks. What is it now, about six weeks? No, four, seven, eight, eight or nine weeks. We have an election coming up. Obviously, if you have ears at all, even with my lack of hearing, partisanship is at high tide. It is just overwhelming. So here's what I've decided to do. I started last week. 
I decided that every Monday, every day, Monday through Saturday, six times a week, I'm going to simply say a prayer, God bless a politician. And on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I am praying for God to specifically bless a particular Democratic politician. Not the same one every day, but just go create a list. God bless Nancy Pelosi. God bless Joe Biden. God bless Chuck Schumer. And the list goes on and on and on. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, I'm going to pray for God to bless a Republican. God bless President Trump. God bless Mitch McConnell. God bless Vice President Pence. You, you pick your own names. You pick your own names. But in the process, what are we doing? We are pledging allegiance to God. We're not saying we don't have a preference in politics. We're not saying anything about that. What we are saying is we are citizens first of the kingdom of heaven and citizens of any country we live in second. And so each day I will be asking for God to be a part of the life of a political servant. I know some of them don't act like servants, but that's their role. Every day I will be asking God to be a part of the life of a political servant. Will it help them? Will it change anything? I can't know the answer to that in advance, but we are promised that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much with God. One thing I know for sure, it can't do any harm. And what I'm asking is, would you care to join me? Or pick your own subject, your own passion, and say, God bless someone who needs his blessing. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who despitefully use you. Now, I do not want us to go back. You can choose to do this, but I don't want us to go back to the Psalms where David prays for God to destroy his enemies and kill every one of them. That is not, I believe, the prayer that Jesus had in mind. Our prayer is that just as Jesus' love overcame the enemies that put him to death, by his red, and he came back to life, his love will tear down walls and create unity among people who even we think at the present time are our enemies. I want to end with two scriptures. The first one is from Galatians chapter 3. In our capital, there is a uh, place where it's written on the wall. Actually, it's in the dome of the capital. And it was painted, this whole thing was painted uh, while Abraham Lincoln was president. But part of what it says there is, E pluribus unum, from many one. And that was a rallying cry for the occasion of what I call the uncivil war between the states. From many one. That's the battle cry, if you will. That's the call of the gospel. From many all over the world, we become one in Christ Jesus. So in Galatians 3, Paul writes, God says through Paul's pen, beginning at verse 26, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What was God's promise? He promised nation that through you, or he promised Abraham that through you all nations of the earth would be blessed. All nations, not just the Jewish nation, all nations. So in Christ, the many, all of us who are many, no matter where we're from, no matter what our skin color, no matter what language is our, our heart language, the one that we grew up with, no matter what our ancestry was like, from the many, we become one in Christ Jesus. And then in Ephesians 2, and I know that I've shared this in the past with when we were together at the building, 
again, Paul writing and says, <clears throat> beginning of verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he, that is Jesus, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, and thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Jesus came to bring peace. People who brandished the sword put him to death. And his love on the cross said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And his resurrection was the thing that abolished the wall between people between Jew and Gentile, between slave and free, between rich and poor, between male and female. And now everyone was welcome. It was not going to be like the old temple in Jerusalem where you had the Holy of Holies for the high priest once a year, and then you had the holy place, and then you had the court of the men, and then you had the court of the women, and then you had the court of the Gentiles who were God-fearers, and then everybody else was excluded. That was not the way it's to be in the church. That was the old way. The walls of exclusion. In Jesus Christ, he brings us all together. E pluribus unum. From all over the world, from China and India and Asia to Africa to Europe to South America to North America. We are one in the body of Christ. What a powerful way to think about life. And what a powerful way to live. Now, this does not negate the role of civil government. And I hear people who try to use the scriptures to say, we have to have open borders. And I have no people that use the scriptures to say, no, we need to build a wall. That's up to the government to decide how to run the country. Our role is to decide how to live for Jesus in a way that speaks into our culture and transforms it into newness of life. That's our role. It's not a role to condemn. It's a role of joy to say there is a better way. We don't have to be at odds. We don't have to be divided. We don't have to hate. Rather, we can learn to humbly walk before God while we seek justice and live out mercy. I hope that you have been encouraged by these Old Testament prophets and by this summary tonight. Being told that we messed up is not fun. We don't want to hear that. We want to hear how nice we are, how good we are, how great we are. And we need to hear that too. God gives that to us. But he is also the voice that says, repent. The kingdom of heaven is here. Repent. Change. Give up your idols of wealth and fame and government and all those things that distract us. And let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. My goal for life is to sit down at the feet of Jesus. I don't deserve his place, don't want his place. I want to sit at the feet of Jesus. And I don't want to hear God say, well done, good and faithful Republican, or good and faithful Democrat. I want to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. I want that for all of us who are in the church. I want it for everyone who's not yet a Christian. That is our calling. That is our purpose. 
And I pray that God will enable us to live up to our purpose and that we not be distracted by the idols of this world. Thank you for tonight. Let's pray together as we uh, wrap up tonight. Father God, sometimes your lessons are hard and sometimes they are uh, fill us with awe and sometimes they fill us with shame. But Father, you do not leave us in our shame. Even when you correct us and discipline us as a good father will do, you offer hope and reassurance that your love never fails, that you will never abandon us or leave us or forsake us even when we're headed in the wrong direction. So, Father, I pray that we will be faithful to you, that we will live out the greatest commandment and love you with everything that we are and forsake the idols that are constantly put in front of us in this world. And, Father, I pray that in doing that, we will do it in a way that we actually love our neighbor as ourself without asking the question, Are you my neighbor? but rather accepting that whoever you put in our path automatically becomes our neighbor. Father, thank you for this church. Thank you for the men and women who have served you well over the years, who are leading this church, who are supporting this church, who are caring and diligent and devoted to who you are. Father, I pray that you will give us door, open doors of opportunity and you will give us a uh, levels of measurable success, that we will not become weary in doing good, but that we will find that you are in charge and that we can celebrate life, that living for you really is the abundant life that your son has promised. Father, where we mess up, we beg for your forgiveness, and we beg, Father, for understanding that we may proceed faithfully on the path that leads to life eternal. Father, bless us, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, next week, Kathy and I, as I mentioned, will be in Pennsylvania. And so I will be doing this from a, a foreign state. We will be in southeast Pennsylvania. Uh, some of you have met my friend John Dubach. Uh, he and his wife are out of town on vacation. We will be staying at their house. And uh, I will deliver a message next week uh, from his house. What I would like to do for the next three weeks is examine the three temptations of Jesus and talk about how we are tempted in similar ways and uh, hopefully provide some venues and avenues uh, for overcoming those temptations and responding to them in a way that honors God. Again, thank you for listening tonight. We love you. I love you. And I pray that you'll have a great week. Good night.